Greetings, it's a pleasure to be with you once again as we focus on Africa, leadership and development. On the show this week, we host the Deputy Chairperson of the African Union Commission, Erastas Mwencha. He shares his vision for Africa and we also discuss the role and the responsibility of the African Union. You get to have your say as well. And we have Africa's top 10. Wherever you're watching across Africa and beyond, this is the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Julie Gishuru. Erastas Mwencha is the Deputy Chairperson of the African Union Commission. Now he's serving a second term in office. He was first elected by African Heads of State in January 2008. Mwencha is a Kenyan-born Pan-Africanist with over 30 years of experience in policy formulation and institutional transformation at national, regional and continental levels. Prior to his role with the African Union Commission, Wencha worked with Kamesa for 25 years and before this he served with the PTA and the government of Kenya. Let's get his insights into Africa. Thank you very much for making time for the Africa Leadership Dialogues. Now, the African Union is an organization that has been with this continent for decades now. Once the organization of African unity, now in a completely new era, the African Union is dealing with an Africa that is really quite dynamic. And, and it seems very fast growing, Erastus. Um, let's start there. What is the mandate and the agenda of the African Union in our continent today? Well. First of all, Julie, thank you for having me on your program and also thank you for the focus on Africa. Uh, I, I should start by saying that uh, one of the things that I miss and I'm a frequent uh, tune in on uh, African radios and televisions and newspapers is the lack of Africa with Africa itself. We're we, 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 we focusing very much on ourselves internally and I'll ask you, for instance, even in your premier organization, if you go and look at the news each day, we hardly have time for African news. And so I want to commend you for this, and I know Thank this you. has also been your passion. Or passion, passion. Thank you. Now, Africa, what is the mandate of the African Union? I would say three things. First, historically, is to ensure that Africa is independent uh, politically from the colonial rule, which was pursued for a long time, up to 1994, when apartheid was eliminated. The second one is unity and integration. This has been elusive, but a lot of gains made in some areas, especially through regional economic communities. And the third one, making sure that Africa is well positioned within the global arena, that Africa can pursue African agenda, and that African interests are defended. I've been watching. For instance, Kenya relationship with the neighbors, where the heads of state and government have been meeting, first of all, to ensure that we can implement infrastructure. And why is Africa realizing that? If you take, say, the country like Rwanda, Rwanda knows that however efficient within Rwanda they can be, they are not going to be successful in pursuing the economic agenda unless they work with Uganda and unless they work with Kenya. Why? Their exports and imports are either through Dar es Salaam or Mombasa. So they need each other. Look at what's happening in, in Ethiopia. Now, why is, for instance, the Lapset project attracting international attention? Because it is talking about infrastructure. So African leaders do recognize that they need each other. And you can see them working in subsets, whether it's in Southern Africa, where you have had the corridor approach, or at the regional level where we are talking about free trade area. Of course, there are all challenges. And I don't want to leave you with an impression it's, just, it's all it's roses. It's a rosy picture. <laughs> no, there are challenges. These challenges are, of course, regional uh, integration has not been fully appreciated and factored into our political agenda. I was watching, for instance, the Kenya elections. And, and I, I looked at the campaign. I looked at the manifestos. Hardly there was a paragraph on regional integration. 
Not that the leaders never thought about it, but the people perhaps wanted to hear the immediate challenges, but they hardly understand sometimes how this affects them. If you went to a farmer who produces tea today and make them understand that their prices of tea will be affected if Nigeria starts to consume our tea rather than us, them buying from London. I saw it happen, for instance, in the case of Zambia, where I was serving as Secretary General Commissar for some time. The copper that Kenya uses used to be bought from the London Stock Exchange. But with Comesa, now that copper is sold directly. And you can have East African cables and others that do that. And that's why I want to challenge you, that we continue to sensitize people to understand that Africa needs each other. Because why is China developing? Why is India? Because they're developing, because they're using their market. Africa, we have one billion people. We have land. We have resources. We can develop if we know that we need each other because others are coming, exploiting this, selling to us the same products we would have manufactured in the continent. So we need each other and we must deliberately promote it and not remain passive. You, you, you remind me of a, a joke that uh, yeah. President Mugabe cracked, or maybe he was, be, he was being serious actually, and he said, English tea, English tea, tell me where they grow tea in exactly. England. You know? <laughs> exactly. They grow it right here, yeah. it, it, best tea in Kenya, yes. in, in the world. Let's, let's just move now from the, the understanding that leadership is starting now to take this seriously to the citizenry. What do you think we need to see from the African citizenry to help propel this continent forward? Well, it's first of all for the African to be proud of being an African. I remember when uh, in the US uh, the black movement started and the people started being proud of being black. That is changing a lot. And you can see we ended up with a black president in the United States. And we must start that self-consciousness to understand that nobody else is going to develop the continent of Africa unless we develop it. But then immediately we must also, as we empower citizens, make sure that the citizens are given information through which they can contribute, even for the African Union. If you look at the Organization of African Unity, it was a state level where heads of state would meet talk and people would just say, well, they had they met, hardly got to know what mm. they have discussed. In changing that paradigm, we must provide for citizens to have the right to know, so that even either through our parliaments, when we commit ourselves to integration agenda, have sufficient debate so that people can participate, enable them to understand that the free movement will help them. Education that is you know, recognized within the continent will help them. That infrastructure will enable them to get goods at cheaper prices so that they will participate and encourage leaders to do so. At the moment, they always think, well, if we open up regional integration, people will come and take our jobs. It is the neighbor who will benefit more than that. And we are playing what you might call a zero-sum game when actually we could add two to two, we expand, we protect the little one we have so that we don't move far. So we need to do that. But at continentally, we must start to make sure that we create an environment, tackle the issue of peace and security, provide infrastructure at the continental level, provide true, what I might call, genuine democracy in the continent, that people can express their will. And these are the standards that the African Union is developing and enforcing. But African Union doesn't have policemen that will arrest heads of state if they don't implement. It's the citizens who we should hold, hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. And when citizens know their rights, demand their rights, and put leaders to be accountable, things will change. Stay with the African Leadership Dialogues. What is the greatest opportunity and threat presented to Africa by the incredible youth bulge? And what is African, uh, the African Union doing about that? Actually, we've had even a dedicated summit on youth. That's because Africa today is the youngest continent. And in fact, projections indicate that in the next 20, 30 years, Africa will account for over 60% of the youthful population in the world. The challenge is how are you going to empower them through education, 
access to resources so that they can uh, create jobs, to employ them, and empower them to be effective consumers. And, and at African Union level, this has been thoroughly debated. And I've seen a number of countries now developing programs, whether you call them youth empowerment. Uh, and and I, I don't want to evaluate how effective they are. But what I can tell you, that yes, from continental level, we have now a program, whether it is empowering science and technology. For instance, we are establishing a Pan-African University. We are identifying those areas where there are scarce skills in the continent to ensure that Africa can participate, whether it's in space science or in some of the areas like climate change, where Africa doesn't have to rely so that Africa can acquire technology. And with that technology, we can then use our vast resources which we have in the continent so that we can create jobs. So that is a continental policy framework. At implementation at the national level, we need now to make sure there are mechanisms where they're creating small enterprises where youths are encouraged to access resources, to be able to access market, to be able to afford education so that this youth is empowered and can participate in the economy. This is what you might call inclusiveness by empowering the youth to participate in the economy. It, it, it certainly mm. paints a new picture for Africa if we're yes. able to, to really do that and yes. at national level implement this. Yes. But just looking back for a moment, you look at South Africa a few years back, back when there was violence um, in South Africa against uh, the foreigners uh, in certain parts of the country. You look at Kenya's post-election situation. You look at some of the violence in the northern revolutions, and and you look at the you know the the, the very debilitating uh, wars in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, and and many other countries, and and the role of the youth. And ask the question: Has Africa let her youth down? Or did the youth of Africa let the continent down? How would you answer that question? That's a tough question, uh, Judy. Uh, my own take of it is that it's both. Uh, let me start from the point you mentioned about the violence we witnessed in South Africa. Some of it which I would put under the category of xenophobia. Xenophobia is an element where people are, feel threatened through immigration when they see these people are coming in to take our jobs and yet you have high unemployment. In other words, they are reacting to the state for allowing the state to be porous to encourage immigration into the country. But this is where I think as leaders we can also educate because, you know, movement of people like water has its own level there can only be a certain element of movement. Even if you open borders between Kenya and Tanzania, not everybody is going to move from Kenya because uh, you know, they want to go to Tanzania. There are people who have got sentimental values that will remain. Only a small proportion may, may do that. But we must manage it in a humane way. We must educate the society to understand. In any case, if you check how many foreigners are taking up jobs in some of these countries, it's not a number that would have created jobs for all this clamoring that the foreigners have taken up our jobs. But we must go out to campaign to ensure you control it because South Africa may need perhaps skilled labor which doesn't exist. We know the history of the country. But why would we be worried about the people who have come because they have come from an African state? But some of it could also have been a reaction because of course, we know some of the things which have happened, for instance, in the case of neighboring states, where there could have been youth ex 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 exodus to South Africa and that reaction. So that is understandable. But also for our youth, um, I, I want to, to, to give examples of some youth I've seen in some of the countries, like here in, uh, in, in, in Uganda. I know of one youth who started by just uh, selling one computer, then move on to become now a billionaire. Mm. Ashish, but, Ashish, that's You know it. <laughs> Please encourage some of those so that they can <laughs> become good role models. Yes. As I look at our youth today, I see many of them being swallowed in drugs or whatever it is. But there is a lot we can do. And so working together with the government, they could come form small cooperatives where they can look at supply needs 
whether it is in the carpentry or machinery uh, and, and so forth. And the state must also be there to support them in terms of giving them loans and all that. So there is, that's why I said both, we have failed them, they have also failed us. And we must always go back to the drawing board so that we can find our way where we have gone wrong. Lots of work for all of us to mm. do. Mm. Uh, finally, please, Erastus, I want you to look into the camera mm. and give Africa your message. Well, thank you for that uh, challenge. First of all, I'm a firm believer that uh, this is a century for Africa. And uh, Africa has to claim this century because we have the capacity to be able to do it. Look at the land resources we have. Look at the population that we have. Look at the market out there. In fact, today we look at the statistics. As some who predicted doom 10 years ago are now saying Africa is the place to watch. But this is not going to happen by us being armchair and uh, playing game or whatever it is. It is for us to be out there, first of all, to promote the African agenda, for Africa to achieve peace and security, for Africa to ensure that we mobilize resources to implement infrastructure to make our continent competitive, for Africa to empower ourselves through education to produce food, because we can't do it. Why should we be importing food when we can produce this food and feed ourselves? For Africa to participate in science and technology, to train our young people, set up educational center where our people can go and learn skills so that they can participate. Look at you know, some of the revolutions that have taken place, like m -Pes and the others. We can do it, but also for Africa to defend Africa so that we solve our problems within the continent. And we can, because no one else is going to solve our problem unless Africa takes the lead. Thank you. Mm. Absolute thank pleasure. You thank you for that. making time for us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. My name is Erastas Mwenja. I'm Deputy Chairperson of the African Union Commission. You are watching the African Leadership Dialogues. We'd love to know your thoughts, your comments and questions on the issues. Right now, it's time for your say. This week, we asked you, in your own view, what would be some of the advantages of continental integration in Africa? Steve Siso says, the complexity of her politics would be reduced and the diversity in her culture and people would be an ingredient towards peace and unity. David Olo says, Integration brings unity, builds economies, and makes goods and services more marketable as a block. My name is Faith Njeroge and I'm watching you from Nairobi. Regional integration within the African continent is very important because it helps to promote trade and therefore the economy of the continent and the member countries. And it does this uh, in three ways. Number one is that it helps to facilitate movement of goods and services across the borders, so it removes barriers to trade. Number two is that it helps to uh, enhance mobility of labor across the countries, that is uh, the human resource aspect. And importantly is that it helps to create a wider market for Africa's goods and services, therefore ensuring that Africa is trading within itself. To take part in our weekly hangouts, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Twitter, at Africa LD. Thank you so much for your feedback and engagement. Time now for Africa's Top 10. On Africa's Top 10 this week, we look into the top most peaceful countries in Africa. This is according to the Vision of Humanity Index 2013. The world's leading measure of national peacefulness, the GPI, measures peace according to 22 qualitative and quantitative indicators. Countries ranked first have a lower score and are more peaceful. Starting us off at number 10 is Mozambique. It's ranked at position 61 globally with 1.91 points. Mozambique is down 13 positions from last year. The previously volatile West African state of Sierra Leone takes an impressive number 9 with a score of 1.9 points. It's ranked globally at position 59. 
Ghana comes in at number 8. The country is ranked 58th globally with a point value of 1.899. It's down 8 positions from its previous ranking. Coming in at number 7 with 1.897 points is Morocco. The North African state is down 3 spots and is currently ranked at position 57 globally. Taking the number 6 spot is the East African nation of Tanzania. It's ranked 55th globally with a score of 1.89 points. At number 5 on our countdown is Lesotho with a point value of 1.84. It has moved up 4 places and is now ranked at position 49 globally. Zambia comes in at number 4 with a score of 1.83 points. Zambia is ranked at position 48 globally and is up 3 spots from last year. At number 3 is Namibia. The Southern African state has moved up 3 places and is now at position 46 globally with a score of 1.81 points. Taking the number 2 spot on our countdown is Botswana. It's moved down 1 spot to position 32 globally and has a point value of 1.6. And at number 1 is the East African island nation of Mauritius. It's positioned itself as the gateway into Africa. With a score of 1.5 points, it has maintained its global ranking at position 21 from the previous year. That's Africa's top 10 this week. Well, we've already come to the close of the show and we end with a quote from Ambassador Amina Mohammed, Kenya's Foreign Affairs Cabinet Secretary. She said, The African Union needs resources to get its work done. We can no longer rely on foreign aid to push the African agenda. And certainly something for all our governments to think about. And with that, I bid you goodbye. I'll see you again next week. Blessings to you and blessings to Africa.